Welcome to your second lecture on um, representation theory. What I'm going to do during this lecture is give you a basic introduction to getting into the Python programming environment. Um, in fact, that was the environment that was used to make these graphs that you saw in the first lecture. In other words, that produced the series the various Fourier approximations to our absolute value function. So all these plots that you're seeing here, the actual calculations were done in Python. Um, for the rest of this module, I'll be using Python mainly because I intend to use it in the um, signal processing part or the pulsar part. However, it's also very, very useful for doing image processing in um, or digital image processing in general, because there's a lot of free um, libraries and stuff available to work with it, and people are actively developing in Python now, um, as opposed to an alternative, which is very, very close, is MATLAB. Um, in fact, as I will show you, uh, MATLAB and Python have a long history of developing together. So anyway, so for this particular part of the lecture, you should have already familiarized yourself with lecture one in the series, and it would be better if you had a printout available of the slides, and I'll show you where to get that now in a moment, so that you know which formulas I'm actually implementing in Python. So this is just a basic introduction how to get into the Python programming environment, and so it's going to be a very hands-on tutorial that will explain exactly how these plots were made. Um, so once again, get a copy of the slides and I'll show you exactly where to get this now. Everything for this course can be found at this website and I'm actually going to go there now live. I have a really, really slow internet connection because I'm nowhere near a town. Um, but I'm basically going to show you where to find the necessary files on this website and then how to get into the environment that actually lets you program. Okay, so firstly, let's now go to the website. So this is the signal processing website. Here you can see the address at the top and this is basically where everything is for the course. If you've not been here before, the first video you watched can be found over here. If you want a copy of the slides, you can simply download. This is a PDF file that has two slides per page with all the information scrunched together rather than allowing you to step through it like I did in the video. Um, this video that I'm currently recording will eventually be uploaded over here. Okay, so to get into the Python, to get the Python program I use to make those plots, we can, um, you just scroll down. In fact, possibly one more comment over here is the notes, another form besides the slides that I used to make lecture one, these notes contain all the formulas that you'll need to have. So you should either have the slides sitting next to you or you should have a copy of these notes by um, Christian Fenter. Okay, so you keep on sliding down, um, scrolling down until you get to, once again, the videos will be archived over here. So once again, there's lecture one over here, the slides that we used. And what we want for the, ba for the purposes of this demonstration is we want the Python program that was actually used to make the images. So here is a link to the Python program. In fact, it's called 301 IPython Notebook. And now to access it, what you need to do is click on it to download. And where it will take you is to a page that looks something like this. Okay. And you can either download it and save it on your computer if you have Python locally available on your computer and Python 3 installed. If you do not have that, or in fact you have a computer that has a very small memory, okay, and I recommend you do this in, regardless just to get started, you go to this thing at the top, this... Um, um, button that says open with Google Collaboratory. So what this is, it's an online way of running this program. So a lot of the processing is done on Google servers and for small programs this is a very nice way get to get into 
pro programming and well as well to share as to share the programs um, just as I'm doing now. So the thing you're going to do is click on open with Google Collaboratory. And as I said, my internet connection is really, really slow. So this is going to take a while. Um, but what it'll do, oh, maybe not so long, is it'll open the code that I used um, in an environment that looks like this. So this definitely doesn't you need a lot of computing power. I have, in fact, actually run this on my phone. So you can do it on your phone with less than two megabytes of memory. Sorry, two gigabytes of memory. So this is what we call a Python notebook. So what the Python notebook does, if you can scroll down here on the side, it has a series of code segments. So you can identify the code segments by this little grouping over here, starting with indicates comments all the way down to that line, uh, to this final command over there. Then you have a second code segment um, here at the bottom that ends over there. And then you have a third code segment all the way over there. And then you have a fourth one. And every all of these things um, have different things that I'll, uh, different uses that I'll discuss in time. Okay, so um, what happens when you push this little play arrow, and I'm not going to do it just yet, I'm first going to explain what the code does. It executes the entire code segment that you have. If you're working in a Python environment on your laptop, you usually push shift enter to, which I wrote, basically wrote up there, to execute a particular code segment. But if you've loaded in this collaboratory, all you have to do is the play button to actually execute it. So what I'm going to do now is explain basically what every line of code does. So if you're familiar with Python, this will be boring. But if it's the first time you're actually doing it, I hope this helps you get into it really quickly. Okay, so what Power Python works and what makes it so powerful and why it's becoming the dominant coding environment at the moment is Python allows people to make independent libraries that then they use all in one code. So for example, what I'm doing here right at the top is I'm importing all the um, independent libraries. So when I say import NumPy, so what happens in NumPy, it basically stores all the functions like cos and sine and absolute value. It's a library that stores all those functions. Then I say import it. And then I say as NP. And what NP is, it's what they call a namespace. So if ever I want to use the cos function that I know is in NumPy, I always put NP.cos in front of it. Then the next thing I'm going to need is I want to actually integrate um, a numerical or I want to numerically integrate a number of functions. And this is written, the, the functions that are going to do that effectively, you can find in scipy.integrate. And so I say import scipy and I'm going to give it in the namespace SPI. So all the functions that do integration that I've imported from this package I'm going to be, access, be able to access with .spi. And then finally, to do all the plotting and stuff, I'm going to say import matplotlib.pyplot, and I'm going to call it .plt. So for, you, for those of you that are familiar with MATLAB, the story behind matplotlib was before MATLAB became software that was sold for a huge amount of cash, people were actually developing it in the open source environment. And it was free and available to everybody. And then MATLAB went later on, closed up a certain amount, portion of the code and developed it further. And that became MATLAB, which the universities now buy at huge, huge expense. When people started developing Python again, which is a free open source software, what they basically did is they took that original library that MATLAB was based on, they started from there and then developed it further. So a lot of the plotting commands, a lot of the way Python works, you will be exactly the same. In fact, the names of the commands 
are exactly the same as what you'll find in MATLAB. So it's actually really, really easy to go between Python and MATLAB if you're familiar with them. So anyway, I'm going to import all the matplotlib um, as a PLT. So whenever I'm going to plot in MATLAB, you would just say plot and then the command. Here I'm going to say PLT dot and then the command. So this next line is just to make those, the matplotlib commands particularly quick to execute. It's not really necessary for this code, but I'll usually put it in. Okay, so the first thing we want to do if we look at the example that um, we did in lecture one is everything went about this function, this absolute value function that was defined on the region um, minus one to one. And then we wanted to compute the Fourier transform of it. So this function we'll be using a lot. And in Python, to define a function, you don't have to put in a separate file. You simply have to say def the function, the argument that goes in, and then the definition of the function. So in this case, the function ff has an argument x. And this can be either an individual real number or uh, integer or a uh, vector of numbers, um, regardless of what you actually bring put in, what it will return is the absolute value of the number. So it's a very, Python is a very concise language. One thing that is important, the indentation is actually part of the language. So you to pay careful attention to how I indent my commands because that is actually necessary. If you don't do that, Python starts giving you errors. Okay, so one comment I should say before I go on is everything with a hash indicates comments. So I've tried to comment the code, well, more effect or more detail in more greater detail than I usually do just to help you. But basically all comments the code, um, uh, the code interpreter doesn't read, it's simply for your benefit. So it simply skips everything with a hash in front of it. Okay, so everything in green basically is not going to be executed. So then what I wanted to do is firstly, now that I've defined this absolute value function, where the absolute value command is actually stored in NumPy. Remember, I imported NumPy over here as NP. So when I want to access the absolute value command, just as when I, just as cos and sin and all the others that sit in NumPy, I write NP dot the absolute value command. In other words, the namespace that I gave it there and then the absolute value command. So the next thing I want to do is I want to define the interval. So the maximum x value of the interval is one because remember we restricted f to being between minus one and one. And then I needed a certain thing to just demonstrate what was happening, a bigger region to demonstrate what the analytic continuation is. And so I said the maximum value for that is three. So now in order to plot the function, what I want to do is I want to make a vector of say 41 integer entries between minus three and three. And the way I do that is once again, a function that lives in a NumPy. I say the X values I'm going to examine is basically NumPy, which is dot um, linear space, which is a command that lives there. And that goes from minus x max, which is 3, to 3. And I want 41 of them, 41 numbers between minus 3 and 3. OK. And what I now want to do is just the first thing is I want to plot what my function does to these x values. And the way I do that is very similar to what we do in MATLAB. It's PLT, because this is where the plot command's namespace is. Then the normal command that I use in MATLAB plot and what I then have is the x values and then I want to, to evaluate the absolute value function at those x values so that's what I do here I simply say ff and when it reads ff it realizes that I've defined it previously and then it, it evaluates ff at those values and the plot I want to make is in magenta and it must have a solid line so that's what this first command does. Then what I wanted to do further is basically um, plot the analytic or the, yeah, the, 
sort of periodic continuation of FF. So if, what I wanted to do here was basically plot FF restricted to the interval minus 1 to 1. So remember x max int was equals to 1. So I want to again make x values, but just fewer of them that goes, that is simply once that goes from minus 1 to 1, and I want to have 21 of those values. So once again, to make a vector of those values, what I say is np, which stands for numpy dot, that linear space command, the minimum value, the maximum value, and the number of entries I want. And so once again, I want to plot what these things are. So I want to plot the x values, the function evaluated at these x values, and instead of making it magenta, I'm now going to make the color cyan, and I'm going to have um, dashed lines indicating it. Then I want to take this function, and I want to move it over to, in other words, I want plotting the analytic continuation. You'll see what that actually does when I execute it. And then I want to take that same function and move it to, to the left and then the two to the right. And so this is what this final command is over here. And so if I now run this code, okay, and the way I run it, if you're in the, the Google Collaboratory to run the notebook, all you have to do is push that play button and basically all these commands are executed. So let's push the play button. Okay. And there it's going to the server, it's going to the Google servers to actually try and run it. And we've just got to wait a moment because my internet connection is really slow. And there we go. It's connected to the back end, it's running it. You'll see this thing up here that basically tells you how much space um, your program is using. And it's already done. It took just two seconds. Okay. And this is the output. So here we see the magenta absolute value thing and then the two cyan analytic continuation just of the part between minus and one and one. Okay, so this big magenta V comes from this plot command over here that went from X values that go from minus three to three and just worked out the absolute value. And then the two cyan or the three cyan Vs come from this lower command where you were simply um, looking at values between minus one and one and plotting the absolute value and then you shifted this two to the right and you shifted the x values two to the left and there I made my analytic continuation. Okay, so effectively this is all that this code does. Um, this code snippet does, it imports the libraries that we're going to be using it defines this function ff, and then the rest is simply getting x values that it's going to plot, and then plotting those things. Okay, so um, my suggestion is that you try and do this part of the code. Make sure as I go along that with the video, pause the video, try and execute everything I've done to make sure that the code is working up until this point, and then when you push play, that you actually do get this um, this picture out, then you'll know at least the code set up in the collaboratory is working as it should. Okay, so that's just base an introduction to basic plotting. What I'm going to do in the next code snippet, which is just below over here, is I'm actually going to start establishing the Fourier series that we plotted. So one thing to remember is if I've defined a function up here and I've run it, as well as all these libraries that I imported up here, th this, these things are then loaded into RAM and they are accessible for later use as well. So you can see how much RAM you've used up here. I've still got a lot to go and um, how much disk space I've used. I've also got a lot to go there. So um, that's fine. Okay, so all these functions are now available. NumPy still holds true. You don't have to type it in at the next code snippet. This function ff, I can also use it in the next code snippet. And so let's actually go about um, using it. So what happens in this next code snippet? I just wanted to make 
a function that gives me back the Fourier coefficients. Remember, we computed that whole integral analytically in the lecture, and um, this is simply a function that if you give n, it will spit out the nth Fourier coefficient. And so if you do that, we wanted to check that n was either um, even or that n was odd. And um, to be able to do that, we have to be sure that n is an integer. So that is something I check once I execute this, fu this um, function. It's usually a good idea if you're working with integers to at least check that the input is the integer because there's no restriction in Python on the input that's coming in. So I basically say if n is an integer, okay, then I can execute the following commands. So I say first check that it's an integer. If it's not an integer, here the else statement is at the bottom. It basically says print that the, in the input must be an integer. Okay, once again, look that the else statement that's associated with if is on the same line. The if statement is indented relative to the definition, and the positioning of your if statements are very, very important in Python. So if it is an integer, then the first thing I do is check if n is exactly zero, then it must return a half, which is the Fourier the constant Fourier coefficient we calculated in the lecture. Then I go on and I say if n modulo 2 is 0, in other words that n is divisible by 2, then it must return 0, and if it is none of the above, in other words it must be odd, then it must return um, minus 2 times, um, once again, the constant pi you can access by saying numpy dot pi, and that will give you the value of pi to 16 significant digits multiplied by n and then to square something in brackets it you use a double a double times that actually means square in python okay so all this thing does this function is now a function that returns our analytically computed fourier coefficients that were computed in the notes of lecture 1 okay and so what i want to do now is i simply want to use this function and I want to go about and I want to output the various Fourier coefficients because I used it to make the plot and to show in the slides. And I simply want a command that prints these things out. And for Python, the simplest thing is you simply say print and then you can give a string analytically computed Fourier coefficients. And then my C0 um, coefficient is simply this function I've just made where the input is zero. Um, C1 is simply the function I've just made where n is set to 1 and so forth and so forth um, all the way up to, so I just did C2 but I know that everything is odd to check but all the others um, simply will print out the values of the computed functions. Okay, so uh, this is simply just what I use to actually write down to get the analytic value or to get those numbers that were appearing at the bottom of the graph that tells me what the coefficients are. So a nice thing about um, the, the programming is that you can actually check this numerically. You can check whether you actually did the correct integral and the way to check that is to actually compute the integral numerically given the absolute value function we have. So that's what I'm basically going to do next. Um, and to integrate the function numerically and to just check, um, remember we wrote down the formulas for the real and the imaginary part of the Fourier coefficient and it was simply what appeared in the integrand was simply a half f of x, which in other words is the absolute value of x, times cos of n pi times x. So once again, the cos function appears in the numpy library. So I say numpy.cos. Um, n is the integer um, of this, the, the Fourier coefficient, the integer that enables the Fourier coefficient. And then you have pi, the value of pi coming in here times x. So that'll give me the real part. 
And then also in the way I worked it out or worked out the integrals, the imaginary part of the Fourier coefficient here is simply Cn imaginary integrand, and that's minus a half f of x, which is the absolute value function in this case, times um, a numpy times sine of n times numpy, the pi value that that's hidden in numpy times x. So the, nice, this, the, the benefit of doing this is suppose we had some other function that was between uh, 0 and 1, uh, that sorry, that lived between minus 1 and 1, we could actually simply f uh, change the ff function to whatever we wanted to work the Fourier transform out of, but these two things where we work out the coefficients will still remain unchanged. Okay, so we basically want to now go about and integrate this integrand between minus 1 and 1, and we wanted to do it numerically. And the way we do that is we have um, loaded this package that we basically put in the namespace SPI. And what that SPI is, just to remind you, we loaded it up here in the first code segment. It's scipy.integrate, and we loaded that, and we called it as SPI. So that is where our numerical integration function is, and there are several of them. There's a default integration function that actually uses some very good techniques. So what we did was we went to this integrate, the, the package, the namespace, so that is all the integrate functions, and the program we're going to use that's going to numerically integrate basically this function is quadrature. We call it, it's known as quad. And how that works is what it does, it requires as input this function that appears in the integrand. In other words, this real integral or the imaginary integral, it requires that as input. Um, and then it actually will compute the integral between two boundaries. So for example, if we want to integrate this function we've defined up here, what we do is we say um, we want the answer, we want the error, that is going to be equal to the output of this function SPI dot quad, okay, the quadrature thing. And here we basically give the place where the function name of the function that we want to integrate the next argument is the boundary, minus 1, and the upper boundary, um, which is 1. So we want to integrate this real function between minus 1 and 1. And if you look carefully at this real function, it changes depending on the Fourier mode that we're interested in. And that Fourier node is labeled by the integer n. So we need to tell this function which Fourier coefficient it's actually computing. In other words, we need a way of specifying n. And what this quadrature function does, it assumes the first argument is the independent variable such as x. And all the other arguments, you can actually specify the value in this way, where you basically say arguments is equals to the various values. Now, you, in this case, there's only one argument that gives the value of n, but in principle, you could have had many other arguments that you then pass through in this manner to the function. So what I'm doing here is simply telling, um, Python is simply integrating um, the, going to the scipy um, library, finding the quadrature thing that actually does the numerical integration, and then I'm telling you, telling it the function to integrate, and then the boundaries, and then the other arguments that go into the function. And the output or the result of the integration is stored in RES. And this quadrature function gives us an error estimate as well that gives us an indication of the accuracy of the result. So once I've done that, I'm simply going to say print the numerical computed version of C1, the first Fourier coefficient the real part, and then I'm going to give it the result, and then I'm going to give it the, ask it to print the error estimate, and that's going to be the output. Okay, and I can do the similar thing. In this particular example, we found that all the imaginary parts were zero because we were basically integrating an even function. 
and this is just going to numerically check that. So basically here is the imaginary part. We have the function, the function we're taking the Fourier transform of multiplied by the imaginary part of the basis function, which in this case is just um, minus a half um, sine of n by x. Once again, the numpy tells you where you're getting these constants and functions from. So this is the imaginary part. So we're going to print that one out. And um, once again, what we're going to do now, and this is also for the first Fourier, co Fourier coefficient, but there's nothing that allows, stops us from checking the high order ones. So we're going to check the second Fourier coefficient, the real part. We know from our calculation that this thing must be zero. And we're simply going to check with that numerically. It does, in fact, give it. So this is what this particular code snippet does. Okay, it computes the analytic um, results, numeric or the numerical values of the analytic results I got, and then it goes on and it actually checks that those analytic results correspond to the numerically integrated version. And if we now run it, all these print commands are actually going to give us the output. Okay, so now let me run this thing and what to run it. In the Google Collaboratory, I just push that play button, and there you can see it's thinking. It thinks very quickly because it's just a bunch of print commands, and there's the output. So here we have the analytically computed Fourier coefficients. We have C0 is um, a half, C1 is minus 2.026, C2 is 0. And then this printed out all the others that are basically showed at the bottom of the plot um, in the lecture. And then here it gives me the numerically computed results where we actually have the real part. And then the error you can see is 10 to the minus 15. So it's just the last couple of digits that are important that are actually wrong. And you can go about and you can directly compare this to that output over there. And you can see that it is basically agrees all the way up until this very last digit. Okay, so our analytically computed result corresponds exactly to the numerically computed result. Okay, we can do the same for the imaginary part. There, the analytic result is zero, and numerically it's also zero up to three in 10 to the minus 15, so it's zero to machine precision. And once again, the real part of C2, we also computed and we expected it to be zero. And once again, it is zero to mis machine precision. Okay, so that just makes, is just a check, a numerical check that our analytically computed integrals are actually correct and that they evaluate correctly. And that's our second code segment. So now the final one is I actually wanted to make the plot of what it looks like as you increase the number of Fourier coefficients that you include. Remember, it's the moment I've run the code segment, all the definitions I made in that code segment, in particular this definition for the analytically computed um, Fourier coefficients is loaded into memory and I can use it in the next functions. So what this code segment does is it basically goes and it computes a Fourier series, but it stops at the highest term. So mm is an integer, once again, that tells us the highest term that is kept. So for example, and here we basically assume that we keep more than just the zeroth term. So the way that this program works is once again, the definition is there, then everything is indented because it's now everything to do with this definition. Um, it works out the base approximation of the Fourier series, and that is simply the zeroth value. Okay, and what I've done here is I've made a bit of a trick. So x is usually going to be a vector of values where I want to evaluate the... Um, uh, the the um, the function, and so for example, in one, in this case that we're going to look at, we're going to look at an x value with say two hundred and one elements. So 
I want the output to have the same size. So what I do is I basically say I want to add the constant term to a vector that's the same size as x that came in. So I simply multiply x by 0 and then add a constant to it. And that basically forces it to have that this f tilde, the base solution to f tilde is um, a series of constants, the size of the x vector that came in. And so what I'm going to do that, once I've done that, I'm going to run a for loop. I'm basically going to say, let the index go from 1 all the way up to m plus 1. Okay, so what this thing basically does, it's going to go, it's going to have m values um, starting at 1 or, and the final one ends at m. Um, and it's going to let this index go over those values. And then for each of those values, I'm going to add the contribution of the positive n value for the Fourier coefficient multiplied by cos n pi x, the basis function, the real part of the basis function. And I'm going to add the negative part the negative Fourier coefficient for the same n um, multiplied by cos of the negative um, the negative n value. So I'm basically starting with a zeroth n value and then I'm taking the infinite series that goes both ways. I put the positive n value over here and I add the negative n value in as well and then I finally give my output. Okay, so I've just defined a function that does that. And so here I basically start, um, I make all the x values where I want to go and evaluate the function. So it's quite a detailed function. So I want 201 of them. It's a good number that doesn't get too big and make the code too long. And so what I want to do now is I simply want to go and I want to evaluate, I want to plot the Fourier series um, for various higher terms. So if I want to keep just the first term, like in this example, I put one over there. Um, I'm going to plot it in magenta. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to plot the periodic continuation like I did in the very first plot so that we can compare the output of the Fourier series to the actual values that are... Um, the periodic continuation, the thing we are actually wanting to approximate. And so this is what this code snippet does. If we now go on and we run it, um, we get this output. Okay, it gives us the periodic continuation, which is just the zigzag of the absolute value of things. And then it gives us the constant value, which is a half, plus just the first sign um, contribution. Okay, if we now want to see what happens if we keep the second term, in other words, all the way up to n equals to 2, then we go about and we change that maximum n value over there to 2, and we simply press play again, and we run it, and, well, the output we get is exactly the same. Why? Because the Fourier coefficient, all the even Fourier coefficients of zero, so we've actually not added anything extra. If, however, we go and we change this Fourier coefficient to three, and we run it, we're going to get this better approximation, because we're now keeping three Fourier, Fourier coefficients, so we're keeping the higher order harmonics coming in. And we can go on. If we change it to 4, nothing's going to change. If we change it to 5, we're going to get even a better approximation. Okay. And so you can see, you can basically, eventually I went all the way up to 17. Um... And there we have a really, really good, where our Fourier series is basically exactly 
approximating our analytic continuation or periodic continuation of um, of the original absolute value function. Okay, so you can play around with this and just make those graphs yourself um, and try and understand what how I actually did this in the code. Okay, the final thing is um, maybe not so necessary at this time, but it's just an example of those slides I make in LaTeX. Okay, and so to get these plots into LaTeX, I literally have to make a file that stores all the values that we've just computed using um, this basically Fourier series partial sum function. And the file I do, and I wanted to make it automatic in a way that I didn't have to run the code, save it every time. And so it was just a little bit of a clever thing with file names. So what I did is once again, I chose my X values. You can increase the number of places where you evaluate the function. And then I said all the files where I want to store um, uh, the, the, the output, I'm going to start with Fourier S. And then I'm simply going to go and run this for loop that basically takes the indexes from um, 0 to 9. And I'm going to add the number of the index where I'm evaluating it to the file name. And the way I do that is I say the file name where I want to store it is this base name. Plus, I want to change my index to a string. So that's where the str command comes in and it changes the index to a string plus dot txt. Then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to print the file name to make sure I've got the right file name. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to save the things that follows over here to that particular file name. And then I'm going to basically stack the X values in the first column and the output of this Fourier partial sum at those X values in the second column. And I'm only going to do the output for the odd numbered um, indexes because other, the even ones don't make a difference. Okay, and then this is just something to say that I want both the X values as columns and the Fourier series as also as columns. If I change this, I could have made just two rows, but I don't want that because LaTeX doesn't read that in easily. So um, if I run this command, what I'm going to do is I'm physically going to write the data that I made um, these plots with to a text file that contains the values. Okay, And I don't want to clutter up my Google Drive, so I'm not actually going to run it now. Um, but if you actually want to keep the things, this is one way of getting the values out. For most part of doing problem sets at this stage, it's fine if you simply save the picture. Okay, I hope this at least helps you get started with Python. Try and play with it. Um, try and see what you recognize for MATLAB. If at this point um, you can simply run the code and get the output that you see over here, you've gotten somewhere and then go back and basically go step by step and try and see how I actually made the code. Just one other comment up here. Um, it's a good idea to save the code um, on your Google Drive or somewhere and save it as a different copy that you know it's your copy and that you've modified it from the original copy that I made. Because if you, once again, if you don't save it under a different file name and you go and click on the file again, you can possibly erase all the corrections you've made to the, um, the thing, to the file that you got. So the moment you start playing with it or you want to change the actual function you're getting the Fourier series of, go and save a copy to your drive that you actually modify the copy rather than the original version. Anyway, thank you very much. This concludes the basic intro to just getting into the Python environment in Google Collaboratory.